Hello and welcome back to fabulous Las Vegas. My name is Savannah Peterson here with special coverage from CES 2024 for SiliconANGLE Media and theCUBE. Joining me today is a fascinating panel of brilliant guests in the space who all happen to be collaborating and all made exciting announcements here on the show floor. Rather than bore you by reading them off, we're going to learn all about them in the upcoming discussion that's going to touch a lot on how speed and inference are going to change the real-time experience for users, and not just users at the enterprise, but also consumers, because that's what this week is all about. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on this fabulous 70s couch. <laughs> <laughs> Are you enjoying the show? Are you exhausted? Pal, let's start with you. Enjoying it, and it is exhausting too, yes, when you walk 20 miles a day, running from one end of the show to the other end. <laughs> yes, uh, does having a little robot on the floor help with that? Uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Embodied and Moxie the Robot. Yeah, so Embodied, we are an AI robotics company developing AI companions to provide care to humans for human development in general. Uh, what Moxie is focused on is particularly child development. So Moxie is this AI companion robot, which is like a believable lifelike character that can engage with you. Using generative AI, both large language models to converse with the child, but also has body language, reads the body language of the child, makes eye contact, understands your emotions, and then helps you develop social emotional skills as well as, as, well as academic skills. I, I, in doing my research on you, I love that you're creating robots that care. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, you are seeing a lot of different applications. I can imagine your show has included a potpourri of things I hope you tease and tell us about. What's it been like for you and AI Explain this week? Oh, it's actually perfect. I mean, so you can see so perfect. many applications. Yeah, I love, love it. Love that. Yeah, compared to 30 years ago when I started AI, and you see what to have. What is happening? I just want to pause there. 30 years ago? 30 years ago. Yeah, when I was stalking you on LinkedIn, I actually had to keep hitting the tab to see how many different AI roles you had had. It's yeah. pretty impressive. You started impressive. when you was 10. Oh, yeah. exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. <laughs> Instead of music in the womb, you were getting AI textbooks. <laughs> yeah, so what we were dreaming of 30 years ago is happening now. You can see all these mm. applications. Mm -hmm of AI in the different areas from consumer to enterprise and so forth. So this is beautiful to, to see that. Yeah. yeah so and, and, and CS is uh, perfect for this because you see not only one yeah. vertical, but so many verticals at once. Yeah. Everything's here and everyone's here. Exactly. That's why I love this show so much. How many CESs have you been to? Uh, uh, Ten, maybe. So, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so not all of those 30 years. No, you know, I came from Germany, so I was uh, CBIT. Yes, not all of them were nice here, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I compare CES with uh, CBIT in Germany, and uh, it's actually f more fun to see what's happening these days than my last CBIT I uh, visited in Germany, like, 10 years ago or so, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. That's one of the things we talked about in our preview show is the relevance of CES. Uh -huh. And I think sometimes there's rumors of it not being that big of a deal. I don't know about you guys, but for me, this year feels as big, if not bigger than ever. It feels like the energy's back so. up. Yep. Mm -hmm. The meetings are happening. The flip badges in the hallways, <laughs> you know, secret things, lots of NDAs. It's been very, very exciting. Jonathan, you are, you're now just, you're on the cube as much as I am these days. How's the show been for you and Grok? <laughs> it's been great. I mean, uh, previous year, 2023, I think everyone started to realize AI was going to become real. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting because people didn't know what to do with it. But in 2024, I think that's the, the year that it really becomes real. Like, not hypothetical, but real. What's, what does that mean? So... You've probably used one of these chatbots, and you've interacted. Mm -hmm. How much do you use it every day? Never. Yeah, it's not engaging. No. It's slow. Mm -hmm. It's not like, I don't know, search. It's not like uh, your, your news feed. Mm -hmm. If it was fast, it'd be engaging. So this year, things are gonna start to become interactive, and that's gonna make AI engaging. It's gonna increase the yeah. usage, and that's going to make it real. So to you, engaging is real. Yes. If you are using it like many that. times per day, 
then it is real. Yeah. And I would say to add to that, uh, what we have experienced with AI to date is amazing potential. But the interface to it sort of reminds us of the early days of computing where you had the flywheel or the hourglass just turning and turning and turning and turning oh, before you, just, you could... You just sent a shiver down my spine, <laughs> remembering that. Oh. Yeah, and, and that does not make for great user experiences and uh, with, with removing the latency so that these large language models and other generative models, because we are going to move towards uh, multimodal systems which require even more compute, That's right. which will make it even slower if we continue down the current path. So making it respond immediately makes it a lot more real. For what we do at Embody, it's actually super important because it's an it's a AI character. It's, it's in physical form and it's interacting with you. And imagine if you and I were having a conversation and every time you said something, you saw zero reaction from me for even two seconds. It's odd, right? I mean, that I just thought about seven jokes I shouldn't make. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> I would not feel as welcomed as I did entering this room right. today. Let's put Actually, it they way. use it in uh, negotiation tactics. Like when you want to make a really uncomfortable moment in, in, a, in a negotiation setting, you just say nothing. <laughs> that void. Did you see? I just tried to hold you out there. Yeah. Right? You did. <laughs> and that, that void in interaction makes people uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? And when we're going towards these interactive AI companions that are going to help people with development, companionship for loneliness and all these things, the interface has to be a lot more fluid than where it is right now. How important is that working with younger folks, with children? Even more important, right? Because yeah. we human uh, sort of adults, we may be a bit more patient or understanding of what's happening under the hood. Kids, when they interact with Moxie, they actually personify it. And to the point where if Moxie, for instance, this is part of the HRI as well, human-robot interaction. Mm -hmm. like working in real-world environments is complex. So let's say Moxie is having a conversation with a child. Something happens in the background that causes Moxie to think the child moved over there and turns away from the child. And this happened in the early days of our development. Children would get offended, literally, like, like, Mom, Moxie's rude, I, want to talk, I don't want to talk to Moxie anymore. Just that subtle error or bug, right, caused that. And delays and incommunication and so on do that too. They are not patient enough for it. What an amazing user test, litmus test. I mean, kids always tell you the truth. It's one mm, of the things I right. love about young people and working with teens. And I can't imagine having a product that tailors to them specifically, but uh, like, wow, it's just, what, what voice of customer there? That's, that's outstanding, that's outstanding research and, and so important. Speed is important in every single thing that you do. Mm -hmm. And when I was stalking you before this thrilling panel, I, I sensed from some of your quotes that as you saw all the different exciting things happening across verticals, you were nervous that speed was going to be the killer. It was, it was going to be impossible to do this without the right amount of power and, and speed. That's so true. So, um, like uh, Jonathan said earlier, I think we, in 2023, we, we had the year of demos and prototypes. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to prove that the demos and prototypes can actually do a thing. And speed is a critical component. Um, I think, I think speed is enabling even the prototyping and experimentation phase uh, to be more efficient. You can run more experiments and so forth. So a person can actually, or a company can actually do more experimentation, more experience, um, user experience tests, for example, to figure out what is, what is best. And, and to today, every iteration is still taking quite some time. It's gotten much easier than again, 30 years ago or 10 years ago, or even two years ago, but it's by far not where it needs to be. It needs to be 10 times, it needs to be 20 times faster so that we can actually innovate much more. And speed is opening up also a new way of uh, thinking about AI. Um, so what some of our customers are using, they're not using one agent, one LLM at the same time. They're using multiple LLMs negotiating with each other to serve a certain problem. It's the same like 
if you are starting, if you are starting, uh, uh, if you want to solve a problem, if you want to start a team to solve that problem, it's a team, five different people, five different capabilities, sitting together, negotiating and discussing some of the things with each other. So you need five specialists to sit down together and monitor each other and helping each other to do something better. So if we don't have the speed, we can't afford to have multiple of these running at the same time. Now with the speed there, the, the sky is the limit. You can do so much more than what you did before. And that's what we do. We have 43,000 models right now on the platform. We want to see them all on Grok so that can actually iterate so much more faster than uh, and with the experimentation each of these small and large companies have on our platform. Wow, that's impressive. How does that make you feel hearing him say that, Jonathan? Oh, I'm, I'm excited. Shocked. <laughs> um, well, not overly shocked, but we've been talking for a while and, and we're developing a great relationship. And I actually think one thing that's really important to note here is the three of us sitting next to each other here with, with you interviewing us, um, we're each representing a different portion of the stack. So we make models go fast, we provide compute capacity. AI Explain here provides the quality of the models, the selection mm -hmm. of the models. And then with embodiment or Embody, it's more about bringing that magic to the end user and that experience. And so you're starting to see the maturity of AI now, right? Mm -hmm. A year ago, I don't think any of us would have known how to find each other. I mean, it was so new. It was the Wild West. I don't even think it, we knew what our interfaces were to each other. We might have even met and thought we were competitors. And now it's like, we don't do anything that's the same at all. So wait, so that's fantastic and news to me. When did, how long have y'all been collaborating? Only a couple of months, really. Has it, like uh, life? Yeah, a couple of months, a couple of yeah. months, yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. with the with the embodied, we had a, we had a longer experience, like a collaboration there on the, mm -hmm. working together for yeah. like a couple of years or so. But uh, now that we have Grok underneath, this this integration between the three platforms is very young. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing a bit about it with us today. That's awesome. You won a CES Innovation Award. I'm actually one of the judges for the CES Innovation oh, Awards. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not uh, I, I'm assuming you won for robotics or in AI. I was not that category. But I'm curious, what does that award mean for you and the team? I think it's great to get recognition, uh, especially in a noisy uh, forum like this where there are thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of announcements happening. Uh, I think. Uh, it's great for my team also because they work hard every single day uh, inventing new technologies, bringing it to the world, and it's always good to get feedback. As a matter of fact, even I, I said the award is a great trophy, but the thing that I really see on my team when they're standing in front of uh, the audience and seeing how people are reacting to Mox is so invigorating and energizing for them, really. Mm -hmm. Like some of the youngest team members that literally are with sitting at the computer all day long and coding, now they're seeing how people are reacting to to, to, to the result of their work. Really fun and energizing. I'm sure when we go back home, everyone is going to be super pumped about the reactions I've seen here. And and you've made it real, right? So Exactly. Um, we were talking to your, your head of PR, and she was saying people would ask, when can I have this? And you're like, no, no, we have it now. It's in the market already, yes. And so I think that's the theme for the year. The year, you know, 2024, it's going to be, what do you have? Yeah. And, and I think that's, it's really cool because, you know, there's so many hypothetical applications. CES is full of MVPs and show cars, like you said, you know, the prototype. And, and something that's actually shipping at scale, leveraging everything that you just described is actually, it's, it's really compelling. And it's... I don't know. It's, it's it's super exciting. I my I, this is my twelfth CES. I started my career in Silicon Valley Nerdland, throwing parties at CES. This is my show. I love coming here. I love seeing everything. It keeps me relevant for the rest of the year, and it's really cool where we're at a such a fun place of the physical manifestation of the cool things happening in software and in and in hardware and the, that makes it all happen. So, I'm excited. So, Jonathan, I know that you had a really exciting announcement this week as well. You've opened up your API for developers and companies. 
when we're talking about making AI real, what do you think that's going to do? What is that going to enable these companies and folks to do like AI Explain and, and like Embodied? Well, as we've announced, we're working with AI Explain and Embody. We're going to be helping to power the Moxie robots' interaction with uh, children. And uh, over the holiday break, we actually took Llama 270 billion, the famous uh, open source model, and we put it on our hardware and we made it available to the world. We made number one on Hacker News. Uh, and we just kept humming. So as a result, we got a very large number of people reaching out to API at grok.com asking if they could get access. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're letting people on a little bit at a time. But our goal is to make sure that this year AI becomes interactive, it's real, it's usable, no more spinning beach ball. I think we're all here for that. I suspect there's, well, maybe you can tell us, what types of customers are the first folks knocking on the door? So typically it's someone who already has a product. For mm -hmm. example, Moxie is real. AI Explain is real. And yeah. you have this product, you've got users, and what you're trying to do is increase the engagement, increase the, the user count. Uh, we're not so good at working with people who haven't figured out what they're doing in generative AI right now, which is a large number of people. But if you have something, if it exists, mm -hmm. and we've got a couple of other soon to come announcements of uh, customers who are going to be using us, some cool. of them quite well known and some of them quite big. Nice little teaser. Yeah, go for it. So I think, it's, so th I am excited because, I mean, since we have now Grok on the platform, we have 5,000 users, developers, which are building existing applications. And now they can actually, with one click of a button, switch and compare, benchmark, how does it look with Grok, how does it look with, uh, with uh, other, other um, infrastructures, and then basically make a decision to switch or uh, what, what they can do. This is actually uh, like a, an enabler for many of many of our uh, users in the, on the platform. Are there any applications uh, that you've seen on the platform that you're particularly excited about, or very distinct trends you're seeing across those five thousand? So I would say user user customer, you, I mean engagement with the users, uh, anything which is. Um, uh, Chatbot experiences, speech input, uh, things things where a, a user is talking to a machine or to a system is one thing, uh, and that's going to benefit quite a bit out of this engagement. For the same reason, Paulo was saying that the system is reactive, uh, responses fast, responds fast. Um, other use cases are now that some companies have a lot of data and they basically need to go through it in a very quick manner, they can do it because now the, the speed, they don't need to run it on, uh, and, and, and wait for days or, or weeks until things go. It's, get, it's, it's getting faster because we can have actually that infrastructure underneath to go through, this, go through the data faster. So this is, and, yeah. and we were talking about what it is that AI Explain does. And I think you had a really crisp way to explain it at dinner the other night. Um, most people probably don't know how they return to you, but do you want to do you want to give that? Sure, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we have every day new technologies coming in. Um, uh, it gets confusing for even us. I mean, I'm for afraid, us, for, for we're in this. We, yeah, we don't exactly. know what models to use. And exactly. So and that is basically the beauty: is if you have it all in one platform, you can benchmark it. it you can discover it first. No one mm -hmm. knows what is there to begin with. So you can discover it, you can benchmark it, you can fine tune it, you can then deploy it all in this in the in the platform side by side with all the technologies, all the suppliers there is. That's a, that's a great thing. So and then it's easy to switch forward, backward to different systems and pick what is best for you. And uh, the more we have, the better it is. Yeah. So are you saying? I know your Jonathan. You mentioned you're with folks. Who, it works. Things work best when people when, already have a there, there. Exactly. Let's put it that way. Are you seeing people a little earlier stage in their journey? We have them too, yes. We yeah. Have them too. So we have, I would say, um, 30, 40 percent are experimenting and trying to build like new experiences with AI. But then we have also the people which are in this for a long time as well and building 
now what we call pipelines, apps, basically AI apps on our platform and building. And then they see that cool. certain components are super fast and other components are slowing the whole pipeline down and they need to optimize. And if the more choices they have to, to benchmark against each other and pick the right one for them, the better it is. So if you're confused about AI and what models to use, you go to AI Explain, yeah. they help you find the right model, they reduce the confusion for you. Yeah. And you have awesome. thousands of developers paying you for this already, and you're just taken off like a rock. Yeah. How, <clears throat> how is it that you are able to make AI Explains engine 10x more powerful? We just make it faster. Well, more, yeah, higher performance, excuse me. So the best way to think about it is if you're building a million cars, you don't want to build it in your backyard. You want to build a factory. And if you need a million square feet of factory space to build the entire assembly line, but you only have 100,000, then you have to set up one-tenth of the assembly line. Then you mm -hmm. have to put a bunch of work product or, or partial vehicles through, collect them up. When they're all through, tear it down, set it up for the next tenth of the pipeline, and so on. And that's the way a GPU works. Mm -hmm. They have external memory, and you have to read from that external memory. And you have to batch the, the jobs through to speed them up. And what we've done at Grok with the LPU, um, we've actually made it possible to just build one big factory. So when we're running something on chat.grok.com mm -hmm. with a Q, mm -hmm. um, what's happening is that's running on 640 of our chips. And that's where we get the speed, that's where we get the cost benefits. Wow. It's, it's the largest de inference deployment that's ever been done by about 20x as far as we can tell. Woo! And it's growing. In fact, uh, we now have about 2,500 accelerators in production and we're growing 15% capacity per week, every week, compounding. So by the end of the year, casual, thousand X. It's going to be an interesting year. It's going to be a really interesting year. What's next for you this year? Well, uh, one of the things we are working on is adding academic development to Moxie. So because mm -hmm. We want to address the child holistically. We have been focused on social and emotional learning today. Now we're expanding to academic development. We are uh, adding memory to the conversations. By the way, something that no chat bot has right now is every time you start a conversation, it's, it's like a new conversation. But with an AI companion, you're building a relationship that evolves over mm -hmm. time, right? Uh, what the child likes, doesn't like, what they're good at, what they're not good at what we talked about, what was their favorite toy, where they went to vacation. That has to evolve because the Mox is evolving with the child and that relationship is evolving. So we, we are adding memory, which is gonna require more compute power and all these things, mm -hmm. which is why I'm excited about everything that Grok is doing because it's not just the LLMs. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a thousand more Speech uh, modules machine. that are gonna require more compute power, right? And then we are also releasing a digital experience, which is going to allow uh, families that may not be able to afford a $700 robot, although that $700 robot, dollar robot typically usually ends up costing tens of thousands of dollars. We have made it affordable enough, but yet there is, of course, we want every child to have access, access to this kind of technology. So we are releasing a digital app as well. So you will be FaceTiming with your Moxie. Um, so there's some exciting stuff coming up this year. How'd you decide on the name Moxie? Oh man, uh, long process, but after many choices, we went to Moxie because Moxie stands for grit and perseverance. And that's a very important trait for any human being to have throughout their life. Yes, <laughs> snaps to that. Totally, yeah. totally agree with that. <laughs> I, <clears throat> we've talked about names on the show a bit, so I wanted to, I was curious about, curious about yours and with the Grok battle that you've been facing. I, when I was doing my research on Moxie and the Stark Accord for me personally, I am mega dyslexic and I, Moxie seems to be going down a path of different types of learning models for different types of learners. Is that, is that a part of your approach or was I just reading into that? With no, my bias. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's not that easy to do, but we, one of the things we are 
releasing later this year also, we call it the recommendation engine, which based on the memory and everything you're learning about the child, then we have a different model that's constantly adapting the activities that are served to that child based on the need of that child. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's sort of personalizing the experience to the, to the needs of the child because every child is different, every human is different. Uh, even to the point where we have a companion parent app, in the parent app, the parent can actually provide some context that Moxie may not have. For instance, we are going to be moving uh, our house, we're going to move into a different state or city. And so on. those transitions are really difficult for children to process. And Moxie will have that as context. Now Moxie can bring up a conversation about that and then start using some uh, strategies to figure out how to cope with that kind of situation so they don't, they don't uh, get anxiety about it and all these things. So, yeah. so definitely personalization. And this is, I call it hyper-personalization. Like every child's experience is going to be different. It's really cool. I had I was on a panel on the CES main stage on Tuesday talking about the future of AI and healthcare. And one of the things I brought up was collaborative care and holistic wellness across things. And I think it's so cool that you're creating, you're leveraging these solutions to make something that can integrate with, with educators, with parents, and, mm -hmm. and with therapists. And I thought that was a really important differentiator to that, that pushes it past novelty. And I know that's something that you're also very passionate about is getting us past that novelty phase and to like your point to, to making it real. What are your biggest, ooh, this is a fun one I hadn't thought about. What are your biggest fears for this coming year? We talk a lot about excitement. Is there anything that could stand in the way of all the greatness we just talked about or yeah, be a bit of a roadblock? So I think instead of talking about fears that we have, I think it's better to talk about the fears that everyone else has that could become a roadblock. So whenever I'm in... That in itself could be a fear if we're really getting mad about it. <laughs> but like whenever I'm in a Lyft or an Uber, I, I try and talk and ask, like, you know, what have you been hearing about AI? And people generally have this sense of dread and concern. And it's so different from us who are in this because we're actually seeing a lot of the positives. I think the first time you had me on your show, I mentioned um, that large language models were going to provide subtlety and nuance and help people understand the world in a better way. Not look at things so black and white, but actually maybe there's more depth here. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, by giving a child access to something like this, you can help them understand the world a little bit better, um, mm -hmm. have a broader perspective rather than this sort of linear programming from TV where it's all about drama and just dragging people into things. Think about the bad behavior that your kids are learning because the goal of TV is to hold your attention. It's not to expand your horizons, to your understanding. By having this in a very engaging format as the Moxie robot, you're actually going to be helping your children understand the world better. And I think we got to educate people on what's possible with AI, not just the sort of numerism that, interestingly enough, is coming from some of these AI companies, which mm -hmm. I just don't understand. Yeah, and I think there's also, there is a lot of stigma um, against AI and robotics and all these things. And Hollywood has not really helped us in that area. When you see yeah, movies like Megan, a robotic companion that ends up basically slaughtering the entire family members and all that. But there are very powerful possibilities here. Uh, I think actually necessary solutions that we need here. Uh, as an example, we were talking about this earlier. If you have if you have a child that may be on the spectrum, you probably will find out from the school. The teacher will come to mm -hmm. you and say, "We feel you may want to figure out diagnosing your child." It's it's a devastating news for any parent to hear. Uh, you will have to work really fast to educate yourself, what do I do? And if you're a family that has access to resources, it will take you at least six months to get your child diagnosed. Yeah. At least six months, right? And after their diagnosis, it's gonna take you another six months to find the right care providers, if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a huge gap of providers to cater to the need there. The same thing applies in like care, providing care for elderly. If they're living lonely and so on, uh, because they have lost their spouse, family members are living too far away, 
they have maybe developed some physical health condition that doesn't allow them to be able to drive anymore, or even leave, leave their home, they're entirely socially isolated. My mom went through that herself. Uh, how are we going to provide care for these people? Oh, you want to? Oh yeah, go for it, darling. You were you were telling me an amazing stat about um, divorces of families who. Can you share this one? Yeah, I mean, uh, to summarize the challenge for families who have kids on a spectrum is one of the stats that stands out is divorce and financial ruin. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. So. And we just don't have enough I providers. I know that. That's so sad. We just don't have enough providers to cater to these families, right? Uh, the same thing applies in other neurodevelopmental challenges. And then it applies also in neurodegenerative challenges, which is when you're in, in your aging uh, phase of your life. And also everyone in between, if you look at the data in mental health and all these things, especially after COVID, there is a lot of challenges with mental health. And we don't have the, the human power resources we're not to trained. together we're not trained we don't know how to right. deal with this stuff right. and yeah and in education just to take another example in education uh the challenge is not so much about children not being able to learn uh but it has to do with motivating them to want to learn mm -hmm. and if you have a child that falls behind in a classroom for whatever reason it, it may be and there could be a billion different reasons one of which could be situation in their household, divorce, 50% of families in the U.S. go through divorce. That's traumatic for children and that may cause them to get off their path and they're falling behind. And when they fall behind, it's a, it's a vicious cycle to get into because now in the classroom they feel embarrassed. They don't want to raise their hand to ask a question because they don't want to come across as not being, as not being the smartest kid in the class. With something like Moxie, it's a, it's a, it creates a safe and non-judgmental space for the child to ask as many questions as they want, go as deep as they want, to explore any topic they want, to find their curiosity and motivation and so on in a non-judgmental way with a character that's going to have the patience in the world. And by the way, the smartest teacher you can ever find because it has all the knowledge. It's a subject, expert, expert matter uh, in every subject you can uh, Imagine. But the way I understand you is also, I mean, we are augmenting basically the educator mm -hmm. the, with the AI. At the end of the day, you, there is no way we can have an educator uh, or with, the, with the child 24-7. There's no way. Mm -hmm. So Moxie is filling that and enabling more. Yep. Um, and that is true actually for many of the places where we use AI. We should not consider AI being necessarily a replacement for the human. Whereas, but there's some applications where AI is going to replace the human. Uh, uh, I tell you a story in my, in, in my, in my, uh, in my past. So when, when I started with eBay, the reason I started the AI team at, uh, at eBay, we had the challenge that we had 80 million used listings every day and someone needed to translate that. In real time, we had only 200 milliseconds time. Translation is a huge thing in this, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then what kind of army will you need to hire? Human uh, that can do it in 200 milliseconds, translate a listing of a thing in 200 milliseconds. So there is no way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, when I started my, my path in AI, it was in translation. That was my uh, focus in the, in the mid-90s. <clears throat> Friends of mine in the translation industry were saying, you're going to steal our jobs, you're going to reduce our jobs, etc. Ten years forward, we actually, through machine translation, uh, brought the world closer to each other. You can actually use Google Translate and other translation capabilities to do the first gist of what you want to deal with and then basically have the human do the final, the final step, so to say. So the I mean, we, we might need to see just how we how can we augment our powers mm -hmm. with AI, and then uh, then that's basically the the, the, the power. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. I hundred percent agree. Well, all right, final question because we could talk all day. What a what superpower do you hope AI gives you or humanity? Since that's what you were just kind of talking about. 
Jonathan, you're the only one making eye contact with me. I'm going to go to you. <laughs> okay. My hope is that AI gives us the gift of um, more personalization in our interactions with other human beings. So, for example, I was talking to an education professional this week here at CES, and they said, of course, teachers are worried that they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose the job that they have. They're going to get a different job. Their job is, instead of having a uh, lecture or a teaching plan for 30 students, their job is going to be tailor that for each student. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have the ability to do that because generative AI is going to help them. So you're going to be able to do more. You're going to be able to personalize more. Warms my heart to think about that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's I, am I am passionate about using AI for accelerating research. Uh, whether it is in oh, yeah. space, in healthcare, stuff like that. And so this is going to be really good. I'm very, very passionate about this one. I mean, maybe we can live longer. Maybe we can get everyone to a better uh, level of education, which is so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is things which I'm looking forward to in the next 10 years or so. Love it. Beautifully optimistic. All right. Uh, I think Jonathan stole my line, so I... I <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think, I, I, I mean, obviously I'm passionate about helping children uh, become uh, their ultimate best. Because I think actually that really can change the world. Uh, I know this is a typical headline in Silicon Valley, we are changing the world by way of doing search engines and that, but this is really changing the world by one child at a time, because they can be much more balanced and positive citizens of this our shared world and future. Yeah, these little, you know, I'm a millennial, and uh, they call us digital natives. These AI natives will mm -hmm. really have a chance to save the world for us. Gen, gen. Yeah. Oh. The generative AI generation. <laughs> gen. <laughs> On that note, Jonathan Hassan and fellow, thank you so much for joining me here on this fabulous special edition coverage from Las Vegas, Nevada, here at CES 2024. My name is Savannah Peterson, and thank you for tuning in to theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news.